Good night. Depends upon where you are in this world. I'm Captain Bill Gustin, live from Springfield Matic University. We're filming this on November the 1st. It will be played on November the 16th. Today, our audience consists of newly promoted or soon to be promoted company officers, lieutenants from the Miami Dade Fire Rescue Department. I've been a captain uh, with Miami Dade for 30 years and a member of the Miami Dade Fire Department for 40 years. Before that, I was a firefighter in the Chicago area for five years. So I'm the oldest guy in the room and the oldest guy on this video. So we are here at Sprinkler Matic today for two reasons. And the purpose of this webcast is two reasons. One is for you to learn some specifics on fire suppression systems. But more than that, to instill in our people, when I mean our people, our fire suppression people, our people that are not in the Fire Prevention Bureau, we've never been in the Fire Prevention Bureau, consequently we don't know that much about fire suppression systems. So what I want to do is inspire the ranks of the firefighters involved in fire suppression to reach out to their brothers and sisters in fire prevention and our brothers and sisters in the fire suppression industry, the fire suppression equipment industry, and learn these systems. Our lives depend upon using these systems more than anybody else. We're the end users. And for the most part, firefighters that are involved in fire suppression don't have a real solid background in fire suppression systems. So, number one, let's learn something about systems today. Number two, let's become inspired to learn more about fire suppression systems. I'm here today, we have a guest. Will, would you like to come up? Sure. Will All Good is with CERN, which is a major, if not the largest manufacturer of stamp pipe outlets and ancillary equipment. That's a tough word. Will, you want to tell a little bit about yourself sure. and what you have for this group? All right, guys. So thank you guys for coming. Uh, Captain Gustin has uh, allowed me to work with your team for the last couple of years now. I helped set some of these products up uh, on my previous world. I was with Viking, so you see a lot of Viking equipment out here. Um, but due to the high rises and things in my expertise in South Florida, um, PRV valves, back clothes became some knowledge. And um, life goes on. I've moved on to Zern now, so I've moved to Zern this year. We've taken a much more concentrated effort on the specific systems of your standpipe risers. PRV valves, back flows, things like that. So working with Captain Gustin throughout the country, specifically South Florida, we've had the biggest piece, but I travel throughout the whole eastern half of the country. I have a colleague that does this on the west coast, so work with any AHJs that we can get to do some training and let you guys understand the importance of these valves you see on all the jobs. I mean, you see this little paper, guys, I put together real quick for your team. Basically, it's just, it just starts right off. Uh, number one reason for failure in these fire systems are valves. Right, and the, the largest number of valves on these jobs, these high rises, are going to be the valves that Bill's talking to you guys about the PRV hose valves, floor control valves. So, really, what I did for you guys a quick definitions at the top of some of the different types of valves that you're going to see and learn about. If I could just in the this will be posted on the website, so it will be available to our viewers when this video is shown. That's right. Okay. And then on the back, guys, in the very end, Chapter 5 of NFPA 25 is going to be your governing body of, the, of what the inspection and maintenance requirements are. So I went ahead and just put some of the basic things in there that tend to get overlooked in uh, busier cities, especially cities that where uh, staffing requirements don't allow you guys to necessarily police this the way it should be done. But what Captain Gustin is letting you guys understand is this is one of these things that we've really this isn't the part that we can shortcut. When you guys get into a situation and your team's up there battling with fire, these are your last line of defense, and the, the testing requirements of this is exercising every year and full flow every five. Keep it very basic, but the bottom line is if these things aren't being done, guys, it'd be no different than y'all going out to your trucks and not exercising your valves and your lights depending on it on the 40th floor of a high-rise building, and this thing don't open up for you to hook your hose to, and now you got no water. Okay. We'll get into the specifics of this. But Will's absolutely right, and I used that analogy this morning in a classroom session. A tank to pump valve on your apparatus it has internal components immersed in water. 
If you let that valve sit for 5, 10, 15, 20, God knows how many years without exercising it, could we rely on it? No. What about this? This is the internal components of a factory set Zern uh, pressure reducing valve. Now, Will is trying to close the disconnect between the fire suppression equipment industry and the fire departments because we have a vested interest. If a pressure reducing valve fails, it's a black eye on their part in their industry, although they will assume no liability if you are not testing it in accordance with those provisions of NFPA 25. But they still we're still in the boat, guys. We're still in the boat. We're in the boat. We both have skin in the game with this. And if the valve fails, you're not going to like it, and it could kill us. So we've got to get the word out to our authority having jurisdiction that these need to be, the PRVs need to be flow tested every five years for a hose outlet, pressure tested once a year. And, and, and uh, exercise full, fully yes. once a year. So this is basic exercise. stuff, guys. This, we know it's not happening. We know for sure it's not. And this is one of those deals where education is key. And I think when you guys start to understand a little bit more about these, and you guys go out to the world and we, we get this message going, it, it's going to be good for everybody. This is literally the last line of defense once you guys get there. This is it. Will, thanks for being here. Thank you up. very much for teaming up with us, guys. And anything we can do, if you're listening throughout the country, I'm, I'm here to help on the whole east side. And I got a guy from the western half, too. So we're here for you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, Will. OK, AJ. Over the water. How does the water go from the city water main into a building si fire suppression system? Water main, of course, is under the ground. Now, we live in South Florida, so we don't have freezing weather. In the northern climates, the inlet to this fire hydrant, which is connected to the water main, or at least a T off of the water main, would be a number of feet down below what we call the frost line. Similarly, this is a dry barrel hydrant. When this hydrant is closed, all of this from the valve all the way up to the outlets and what we call the bonnet should be dry. As a firefighter up north, when I would fill a booster tank after a fire, muscle memory we would close the hydrant you put your hand over here to feel that the hydrant is draining how would it drain right down here when we open the hydrant we close the drain when we close the hydrant we open the drain to allow the barrel to drain if that doesn't happen you'll have a frozen hydrant and we know that is a huge problem in cities like Chicago and New York, where they have frozen hydrants. It's the nemesis of firefighters in the wintertime. So dry barrel hydrant. This one is equipped with what we call a traffic flange. So if you hit it in your car, it has a tendency to break at this frangible connection right here. Also, the stem will separate. Two reasons. One, so it doesn't kill you. Secondly, so we don't have a geyser shooting 30 feet up in the air. Now there is another type of hydrant that you see primarily in the Los Angeles area, in that, that part of the country. Because they don't have freezing weather there, they have what's called wet barrel hydrants, where all the way up to the top is water and you have an individual control for each outlet. Remember that a hydrant is designed to flow its rated capacity at with all the uh, openings flowing. So at the very least, what we want to do is put a gate valve on here. Make our connection to our fire apparatus or supply line, and then subsequently come back and attach another supply line and control the flow with the gate valve. So that's basically how the water is coming into the building. From there, it will go to a back flow prevention device. We explained in the class that we've got a 30-story building with 150 pounds of head pressure exerted at the base of that riser. You got 70 pounds of water in your water main, let's say. 
We don't want that putrid water ending up in the potable water supply. So what you have in here are two check valves, two. The reason for the outside stem and yoke valve, this one of course being open, you can see because of the stem, this one being closed is to isolate this valve so that we can service or replace the backflow prevention device. Now, you will not see this in Chicago or Minneapolis because it would be frozen in the wintertime. This will be in the basement. If you'll come over here, we have a meter on this one. Why the meter? Because as a building owner, you do not pay for your water for fire protection. You pay for the connection, but not for the actual water. So what may the building owner be inclined to do? Let's say that it's a uh, produce warehouse or a meat warehouse. Connect up a garden hose to a sprinkler system, tap into the sprinkler system, open that up and wash down the porcelain covered walls and ceiling. Meter reader is going to come up and they're going to see, wait a minute here, this guy is taking water from a fire suppression system. It's going to make you pay for it. So, or you've got a leak in your system. So this one has a meter in it. So let's say that we do close these valves. Or let's say that there is a post indicator valve that shuts off the flow from the city water to the system. Can we still use the system? The answer is yes, because we're all familiar with the fire department connection. Now, when we say we're going to pump the fire department connection to augment or support the system, that's really not the case. When a fire department pumper is connected to a fire department connection, if it can pump a higher pressure than it is on the system, which may be supported by a fire pump pumping several hundred pounds of pressure, you supply the system with the fire pump. Conversely, if you pump less than system pressure, you will fail to open this check valve. You will have system pressure up to this point. If the system pressure is 250 and you pump 150, you will fail to open the check valve. There is a clapper inside of this connection. And as firefighters, when we have plugs, and a plug is nothing but a, a, a mail cap, a cap with mail threads. If you have intentions of putting two lines into an FDC, take them both, both plugs out at the same time. If you pressurize one side and this clapper fails to seal off the, out, the outlet or the inlet, pressure will build on the male cap and if you do manage to get it off, it will become a missile and hit you in a sensitive part of your body. Let's leave it at that. So, if we can exceed the pressure on the system, we will open this uh, check valve, and when we walk over to the fire pump later, we will close the check valve for the uh, fire pump on the discharge side. Okay, AJ, let's stop. Got water flow indicator, bolted to the pipe, flow of water, it moves that flapper, which completes a circuit and initiates a water flow alarm within 90 seconds. And it can be adjusted, the delay can be adjusted inside here. ...of a combination sprinkler and standpipe system, and this is the most common in our jurisdiction. In other words, we have a standpipe typically one in each stairwell with hose outlets for firefighting and control valves for the sprinkler piping that branches off of the standpipe system. Now on each floor you'll have one or more what we call floor control, zone control, or floor isolation valves. Some buildings the systems are looped so you will have more than one control valve. Others, it's odd floors, may be served by the 
west stairwell, even more by the east stairwell. So, conventional outlets are for systems that do not exceed 175 psi on the outlet, on the, on the outlet side. If the system is over 175 psi, it has to have some type of pressure reducing device. Let me explain that again. NFPA 14, which is our standard for standpipes, requires that pressures do not exceed 175 psi on standpipe hose outlets. Where does this get to be a problem? In a very tall building because your fire pump is going to have to generate a heck of a lot more pressure than 175 to achieve a flow of 100 psi at the roof. So we have to have some way of controlling that pressure, of reducing that pressure. We do that with a pressure reducing valve. This is a pressure reducing hose outlet valve. This is a pressure reducing sprinkler control valve or zone control valve. The way that these work is that there are moving parts in this valve that respond to fluctuations in pressures downstream. We connect up a fire hose, we open the nozzle, pressure drops, there's a waterway here. It allows water to flow up and fill this chamber. Water in this chamber acts upon this piston opens, closes, or throttles this valve and controls the pressure in both static and in flow. How can you tell the difference between a pressure reducing valve and a conventional? Pressure reducing valve. I know of no PRV that does not say pressure reducing valve. One of the dead giveaways is this. Threads, no threads. Threads on the conventional, no threads on the pressure reducing valve. Now, the pressure reducing effect of this valve is determined by the surface area of this piston. If you were to look at this valve, you would see that this piston is smaller. Hence, this would be installed on lower floors, this would be installed on upper floors where the pressure would be less. Now, there are two basic types of pressure reducing valves. This one is set at the factory. It's a factory set valve. When it comes to the job site, it will specify what the floor is and what the inlet pressure should be, it's the static and residual inlet and outlet pressures. The outlet pressure has to be between 100 100 and 175 PSI. So this is factory set, and each manufacturer has its own designation for pressure ranges. This is a type Q. This device here happens to be a type S. Q obviously has more pressure reducing effect than the, uh, the S. Now, that is a factory set. That is one type. The other type is field adjustable, sometimes referred to, in some cases, as fire ground adjustable. This valve actually came out of Riviera Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada, where I was very proud to participate in a, uh, in a uh, full-scale standpipe drill at that, at that location. And I'm looking for the adjustment rod, which I don't see, so I'm not going to worry about it right now. But the way that you would adjust this is insert a metal rod in here. And what you're doing in a field adjustable valve is tensioning or loosening a spring.
valve, and you can see the spring. The spring, the amount of tension. This works exactly the opposite as our relief valve. Whereas the tension of the relief valve would work against the relief valve to keep it closed, tensioning this will have a tendency to open the valve, open the valve, and work against the water that's acting upon the piston here. Now, on this type of valve, they don't use a rod. They use a 1 16th socket. So you would have a socket wrench. Take this off. 1 and 1 16th socket to tighten or loosen that spring. Okay. So that is the field adjustable valves. Now, we'll all now can see why we have to test these devices in compliance with NFPA 25, which is the standard for testing water-based fire suppression systems. We have moving components. In fact, in this case, can you see that the hand wheel is not even mechanically connected to the piston and plunger assembly? What is required is every year this outlet valve has to be tested with a pressure cap gauge to at least bump it off of the, the, off of the seat and to make sure that the pressure is between 100 and 175 in static. You imagine, you just let this valve sit for 5, 10, 15, 20, God knows how many years without exercising and deploying. Would we tolerate that with a piece of fire apparatus? No. Tank to pump valve. Internal components immersed in water. You didn't flow it for 10, 15, God knows how many years. How reliable would that valve be? We're put, staking our life on this. So, if we had a flow of water on this type of simple system, Tammy is going to demonstrate how she is going to close the drain, close the, the control valve, and open the drain. So, would you come up here, Tammy? Okay? All right, so Tammy's going to close the valve. Okay, and then just stand by there for a second. Now, she's going to operate this valve. This valve has three positions, off, test, and drain. In the off position, obviously, it's off. In the test position, it presents a half-inch orifice that replicates the flow of one sprinkler head to test the function of our water flow device. Tammy, we're going to go all the way to drain, which in this case will present a full one inch drain to drain the water that is going to be trapped between the closed valve and the sprinkler head that has been activated. So that otherwise, if you just close the drain, the valve, the water will continue to run. So we're going to go ahead, we're going to shut down the control valve we did. Now, Lift this up and move that valve to drain. There you go, and you see we've lost the pressure. We've drained it. Now, in a perfect world, we would not be the ones switching the sprinkler head. And if there was a, if it was a perfect world, there wouldn't be a fire department. So we may be changing the sprinkler head. But of course, we will follow up with the Fire Prevention Bureau as soon as possible to make sure that the proper head was installed and that the system has been inspected by a certified fire suppression system contractor. Okay, we've changed the sprinkler head, Tammy. We'll go ahead and we'll close the drain. All right, and then we will open the control valve. Now, you may or may not hear this. There's a diesel fire pump and there's a jockey pump. Because we're gonna drop the pressure in the system, you should hear the jockey pump kick on. So go ahead, Tammy, turn it back on. That was the jockey pump, kick back on. Okay, thanks very much. Tammy, yes, you did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> now, 
These systems are very near and dear to our hearts. This is what's called a 13R sprinkler system, R for residential. It is designed and intended to protect the occupants and buy them time to escape the fire. It is not intended to prevent the building from being destroyed by fire. Why? It flows very little water for a small fuel load. It cannot thwart a de determined arsonist. Also, the biggest deficiency in this type of system is there are no sprinkler heads in combustible void spaces. Most notably, the interstitial space that's between the ceiling and the subfloor of an apartment building or townhouse that is supported by parallel cord floor trusses. I don't know that you can get a view of this right now, but there's I'm looking at one right there. Okay, good, all right. If you have a fire that originates or spreads into that space, there'll be no sprinkler. Nothing, nothing to, uh, to extinguish that fire. And, and there have been fully sprinkler buildings. Sprinklered in the sense that they're protected by a 13-hour sprinkler system that have been destroyed by fire. So Susie, you want to come up? We're going to go ahead and control the flow on this. Now, where do we see this just for our Miami-Dade guys? They're all over our county, semi-enclosed stairway, uh, where you have four apartments at a landing. You'll find a cabinet outside the building, and you, the maximum stories you would have with this would be three stories. You usually are looking at a cabinet, and there's three pipes coming out. And it'll be for first floor, second floor, third floor. So you want to try to find that cabinet on the side of the building. And when you do, Susie, it's the same thing. You're going to shut off the control valve here. It'll indicate that it's closed, and we'll initiate a tamper switch or uh, uh, supervisory alarm. So go ahead and shut that off. All right. So we so we see what got. Yeah. Of course, that would not be the case if there was actually a sprinkler flowing. Now here, since we've got it shut off, we're going to pull this lever and move this lever to drain and you watch that pressure just drop. There you go, there you go, okay. We've drained the water that was trapped between this closed valve and the open sprinkler head. They changed the sprinkler head, okay? So now we're gonna restore the system. We go ahead and we will close the drain. Very good. And we're going to slowly open this valve because if we open it too fast, we may exceed the capacity of the jockey pump and start the diesel fire pump. And if that happened, we'd have to write you up and suspend you, probably give you about oh, two weeks off, okay? But I don't wanna make you nervous, all right? Okay. okay, go ahead, open it back up. Thirteen R sprinkler systems are not a firefighter's friend. They're better than nothing, but they do not protect combustible concealed spaces. Again, control valve, check valve, flow indicator, combination flow, uh, drain and test, and relief valve. Thank you, Susie. And uh, now, let's move on to this sprinkler riser, sometimes referred to as a shotgun. Now, again, I'm talking to our brothers and sisters in, in warm climates. We have no excuse not to be familiar with the components of the sprinkler system because they're naked, they're outside. We can drive down an alley and see all of this stuff behind a store. So let's say that this is a, a dollar store or a, a Walgreens grocery market. One riser, again, with an indicating valve, which in this place, in this case, would look like this. When we operate the valve, this is called a butterfly. Obviously, that's open. 
Obviously, that is closed. That's the type of valve that we're going to operate. Now, this has a control valve, of course. It still has a flow indicator. And in standard sprinkler systems, the drains are two inch. Now, in this system, the drains are piped back into the reservoirs. In reality, you would see water uh, on the outside of the building through a two inch drain. So in this case, uh, come on up, Mark. We've got a water flow. We've uh, determined that the fire is either out or it's a broken water pipe. We're gonna go ahead and close the control valve. Come on over here. Go ahead and close the control valve. Okay, and we can see that we're, we're shutting it off because of the, the indicator. Okay, Mark, now press that little button and let's move the lever to drain. All the way to drain. All right, brother, we have effectively shut off the sprinkler system. We've drained the water that's trapped between the closed valve and the over, over uh, the activated sprinkler head. So Mark, go ahead and close it. Mark, we're gonna do this on purpose. It may or may not turn on the fire pump, but I'm gonna have to add, I'm gonna ask you to open it fairly fast. In reality, if the building had a fire pump, we would shut that fire pump down because we would never use the fire pump to fill open sprinkler piping any more than we would we pressurize a hose line or pressurize our pump at 300 PSI and yank a valve open. We would shut off the fire pump and allow the jockey pump to work. But go ahead and open it up. Let's see if it, uh, let's see if we'll set the fire pump off. I know we're getting ahead of ourselves. Mark, we'll go ahead and we'll turn the riser on the rest of the way. Okay, do you see why we don't want to fill that pipe with the fire pump? Because you go from zero pressure to as much as 250, you never know what kind of pressure. But we know water hammer is not a firefighter's friend. Mark, we'll put it back on all the way. All right. Now, this Thank you, Mark. This is one of my favorite sprinkler installations because it's old school, just like me. This has been around for well over 100 years. This is before you had electric alarms. You had an alarm that was powered by water. It's almost like a fire pump in reverse. So you have a control valve you have what's called an alarm check valve, which serves two purposes. One, before they had backflow prevention devices, this would prevent backflow. This would pre prevent the column of water from going back into the potable water supply. Additionally, the clapper that is in here lifts and allows water through an alarm line that goes up to what we call a retard chamber because there will be surges in sprinkler systems as you well know because four, five, six o'clock in the morning when are you responding on water flow alarms? That's during the time when people are taking showers, flushing toilets, the water utility kicks on extra pumps through the surge in the system. To compensate for surges on the newer systems there's a delay in the water flow alarm. Here there is a drain in this retard chamber. If the retard chamber can drain faster than it fills due to a surge, we will not activate the water motor valve. 
Most of these systems have been retrofitted here with a pressure sensitive electric switch that will initiate a water flow alarm. Here, we're going to test the water motor gong in school. And I'll tell you this, if you have a building that has the old school water motor gong, you'll see a drain at the base of the bell. If there's a puddle of water and it's not still flowing, it was a pressure surge. It was a surge in the system. So I'm going to move this lever and allow water to bypass the alarm check valve. And we're going to fill the retard chamber. Once the retard chamber is filled, fills faster than it can empty, we will ring the water motor line. Old school, this would drain out on the ground. Now, this is a dry pipe valve. This is used in freezing environments. This would consist of a dry pipe valve, what we call trim. There is air in this system, not water, air in this system that is holding a clapper valve closed. When a sprinkler head is activated, it allows the valve to open up and actually latch, which I will show you, and allow water to flow out of the open sprinkler head. First, air will come out. And sometimes these systems will have devices called either accelerators or exhausters to hasten that release of the air so that the valve can pop open. Now, understand that your you're going to have to have an air compressor. And all of this up to here would have to be in a heated area. Do we have these in Miami-Dade County? You better believe we do. We cold storage warehouses. We've got plenty of them. So in this case, if we were, you've got air holding this closed. If you had an activation of a sprinkler head, it would bleed out the air and allow the valve to open. So I'm going to test this, and you'll probably hear something open up in there. catches and it latches. Release the latch, comes down, and that is the internal components of a dry pipe valve. This is a pre-action system. You see, Kenny, come up here. Kenny is a good firefighter and an excellent fire officer. Kenny is a lousy forklift driver. And every other day, Kenny is hitting the sprinkler piping in the warehouse on his side job. Now, the reason that we don't fire Kenny is that he's married to the boss's daughter. So because Kenny keeps hitting the sprinkler piping, the boss installed a pre-action system. It has air in the system, but it's not holding any valves closed. It's for supervisory. When Kenny hits the sprinkler piping, air bleeds out of the system, does not flow water, but initiates a supervisory signal so the boss knows it's time to fix the pipe. Single interlock, interlock, what do I mean by detector and activation of a sprinkler head? First is, let me take this. In a dry pipe sprinkler system, you typically will find upright heads. 
And of course, as firefighters, you know, there's three types of sprinkler heads. Upright, pennant, sidewall. This happens to be a sidewall head. This is called a dry pennant head. Consider this. You don't want to bear the expense of a dry pipe valve. What if we did this? What if we had walk-in chillers, walk-in coolers, walk-in freezers, where above them is ambient temperature? Could we take a dry pennant head and drop it down into this cooler, insulate it extensively with polyurethane foam? Now, this is a sidewall head. So you might see this in uh, an area to protect a balcony. It's cold. But what you have here is the ability to go into a freezing environment without having a dry pipe system. Because you have a shaft in here. You have a plug on both sides. We all know that there is a plug that holds water back on a sprinkler head. And in this case, it, the plug is released by the activation of a heat sensitive chemical. Here, when the sprinkler head is activated, there's a shaft in here that drops, which dislodges a plug here. This plug is released as well. Water flows into the cold space. Ambient temperature up here, insulation into the cooler or balcony, cold, freezing weather out here. Dry pennant head, a dry pennant head. This is old school, outside, stem, and yoke. This one's in beautiful condition. Now, two things, brand new, and there's no pressure behind it. I know that all of you have control and sometimes, sometimes it takes two firefighters. A wall post indicator valve. So in this case, if I wanted to close this valve and it would have a reach rod that goes through the building. This is on the outside. If you will see a sign for the sake of time, I'm not going to do it. That will say open or close. In a fire, even if it says open, give it a shot. It could be stuck. Make sure the valve is fully open, even though it says open here. Open or close. Wall post indicator valve. This is the facility's diesel driven fire pump. There are electrically driven, there are diesel driven. Electrically driven fire pumps are commonly backed up by a generator and what we call an automatic transfer switch. If the power goes out to the building, the transfer switch kicks in, starts the generator, and transfers the generator power to the electric motor that drives the fire pump. The pump is very similar to what we have in our fire apparatus. So in this case, this is a diesel engine. City pressure would come into the system here. If this was Miami Dade County, we'd be reading about 70 psi static city pressure. When the pump kicks on, this generates about 125 psi into the system. Think back to pumping the fire department connection. If you pump at a pressure over what this pump can produce. You open the check valve on the fire department connection and you will close this check valve on the side, the discharge side of the pump. Now, we got to do something to relieve that pressure. What do we have on an electric pump? You have a casing relief valve. It discharges water onto the floor at a floor drain, this was an electric pump, right here. There is a relief valve 
I'm this diesel pump, but it's for a different reason. Diesel engines occasionally, and I think you've seen it in motor vehicle accidents, where diesel engines will run, go wild, run wild, over speed. If it over speeds, what's going to happen to the pressure in this pipe? You're going to burst the system. So you have a very large relief valve controlled by this pilot valve assembly adjusted here. In case the diesel engine should over speed to control the pressure, very large relief valve dumps a lot of water. You have your control valves. The way this is set up is you have a bypass, and in this particular installation, you actually have a flow meter. So we can flow water up through the check valve, through the flow meter, and it's piped back to the fire pump test header, test connection, back into those reservoir tanks. When we're working on the pump, we close the OS and Ys, we close the butterfly. In that case, we could remove the pump and we would still be able to supply the system through the fire department connection. That's the beauty of the way that these are set up. Now, electric pumps have a relief valve that when the pump is not flowing or flowing very little, the relief valve will kick open to uh, keep the pump cool. Over here, AJ, we have two cooling lines. This is the standard regular cooling line. Whenever you see this, this is an electrically operated valve. Water flows through here from the pump, from the pump, so there's always water flowing through the pump, up into a heat exchanger goes through, goes up into a heat exchanger, and then by design, by code, discharges on the floor. When you check the fire pump, you go into the fire pump room, you want to see that water discharging. If you don't, there is an emergency line right above it that you can turn on to keep the pump cool. Now, the brains of a fire pump is its controller. There's a water line that goes into the controller for the fire pump. There's a water line that goes on the controller for the jockey pump. The jockey pump is here. It's a low gallons per minute pump to compensate for minor fluctuations in pressure. When you have a significant flow of water, it overwhelms, it overwhelms the jockey pump, which drops the pressure in the main pump controller to the point where the pump starts. So what we're going to do is we're going to run through a process here where we're going to drop our pressure. First, you'll hear the fire, the jockey pump one. Again, if you drain the system and you need to Refill it, shut the fire pump off, operate the jockey pump. And I use the fire pump because it's going to be a water hammer. So, if we just crack this, and then you'll pan over to that. just flowing through the relief valve if we're cooling. A diesel pump will run for a half an hour with no demand and shut itself down. A electric pump will run for 10 minutes and shut it down. If there's no demand, all you have to do is press the off button. If there is a demand, when you take your finger off the off button, the pump's going to start right back up. So if that's the case, then you're going to have to shut it off the main disconnect if it's 
an electric pump, remember, transfer switch first, main control, and of course the jockey pump control. Let's look at sprinkler heads, three basic types. Upright, how do we identify it? It's got a fairly large deflector. It also will have on it SSU for upright. Pendant, SSP. Obviously, there's a difference in flow here between a residential head that you would see in a 13R or 13D system that would flow no more than 25 gallons a minute. And this bad boy, which is an early suppression fast response head, that could flow as much as 175 gallons a minute. Now, this is the type of head that you would see in an IKEA furniture. Now, Susie, you were talking about this morning performance-based systems. There is no prescription or code that specifies how to protect an IKEA furniture with mass quantities of combustible materials in the racks. So they had a fire protection engineer designed and certified. He assumes the liability. And the way they get away without having sprinklers in the racks at IKEA and similar occupancies is the slats are just slats, they're not solid shells. Hence, the heat can convect up, water can cascade down. If you have solid shells, you're gonna to have to have sprinklers in the rack. This guy can flow as much as 175 gallons a minute. That's how they get away without sprinklers in the racks at IKEA Furniture. So, little guy, little guy, residential, big guy, and they're rated Systems are rated in gallons per minute per square foot, discharge density. Simply put, you're going to have a greater discharge density in terms of gallons per minute per foot in a tire warehouse than you will in your apartment. Okay? So, we talked about the sidewall head, and we talked about the dry pennant head that could go down into a freezing space if this is ambient above. This is a recessed head. You see these in our classroom that we were in this morning. You have a white decorative cover that is attached by solder to the sprinkler head. At about 135 degrees, that solder melts, deflector drops down, and of course the bulb has already been activated. So again, 135 degrees, the cap come, melts the solder, cap comes off, boom. All right, this is the array of sprinkler heads at Sprinklermatic. From the left, we have residential heads, such as what you'd see in an apartment for a 13R, 13D sprinkler system. Very low flow. The first head is a Viking sprinkler head. It is a pennant head. It is designed to flow 26 gallons per minute at 21.6 PSI. Now, we're going to get wet, AJ, so we're going to have to move the camera over here just a little bit, and we'll focus up on the head. It will be the one on the extreme left. Okay, number one, Susie. Perfect. Perfect. Number two is going to be an upright. It's going to be an upright. It's going to flow 26 gallons a minute again at 21.6 PSI. Residential. Number three is going to be a light hazard for light hazard storage. This would flow 20 gallons per minute at 12 PSI pressure. And this 
head will be a sidewall, a sidewall head. Go ahead, Susie. Storage areas that would depend upon how much pressure is in the system. And number four is another sidewall head. Go ahead, Susie, number four. Number five, flow head depending upon system pressure. And it is a pendant head, a pendant head. Go ahead with number five. I believe the solenoid valve for number six is not going to work, but we'll give number six a shot. Now this is a big boy. This would flow 178 gallons a minute at 50 PSI. Again, I don't think that six is gonna work, but we'll give it a shot. Okay, it doesn't work. Okay, we're gonna go. Early suppression fast response, ESFR. This is designed to flow 99 gallons a minute at 35 PSI, and it can be used with a 34 foot high ceiling and 29 feet of rack storage. So let's give seven a shot. Right, do you notice something else? The density. The de Remember, this got to get down through slats of storage racks and it, it has to be able to defeat, get through the updraft, the thermal updraft, the thermal plume of the heat convecting up. So you have a much denser spray for this. Also, this is to pre-wet other items that haven't caught on fire, but will catch on fire. All right, the last one will be another ESFR designed to flow 166 gallons a minute at 35 PSI with a 48 foot ceiling and 43 foot of storage. Now I can tell you right now, we are not going to see this head flow 166 PSI with this arrangement of piping. This is a demonstration relative, relative flows. This would have to be engineered with very robust sprinkler piping, which we do not have here. So it's relative. This would flow obviously more than sprinkler head number one. Go ahead. All right, this is going to conclude the webcast. My objectives, again, were to teach you some things about the components of sprinkler standpipe systems, backflow prevention devices, fire department connections, and fire pump, jockey pumps. Specifics. But more than that, to inspire you as firefighters primarily involved with fire suppression and running emergency medical service calls to reach out to the professionals in our fire prevention bureaus and our fire suppression system contractors to learn these systems. We're the end users, users, we are the end users. And in many cases, our lives could depend upon how well these systems function. They have to be tested at regular intervals. This is Bill Gustin from Miami-Dade Fire Rescue. Thank you very much for watching this webcast.